And welcome to High School Physics Explained. And today we're going to concentrate on the BCS theory, the theory that helps us understand how superconductors work. And of course, if you really like this video, please remember to press the like button. And by all means, please share if you find this video useful to your friends and your peers. But before I go on, I do also want to remind you that this is a channel called High School Physics Explained. So that, therefore, if you're interested in the quantum mechanics aspect of BCS theory, you won't find it here. This is all about understanding it from a high school perspective. So let's begin. Before we go on, let's briefly discuss the history of superconductivity. Superconductivity was first discovered by Heike Ones in 1911. He cooled mercury down to 4.2 degrees Kelvin and discovered that its resistance decreased slowly, as you would expect for any particular conductor, but suddenly plummeted to zero resistance at 4.2 degrees Kelvin. Now, he couldn't explain it at the time, but certainly he was the first to really observe it. In fact, he won the Nobel Prize for Physics later for this discovery. The other important discovery is the discovery of the Meissner effect. That is, superconductors expel all the magnetic field that try to penetrate it. And one of the things related to that is the levitation effect that you can see in this video right here. To help us better understand the issue with superconductivity, let's have a look at the graph of two variables involved with superconductivity. The first thing is temperature. And we're going to put temperature on the x-axis. And the second thing, we're going to look at resistance. And of course, that is measured in ohms and that is measured in Kelvin. Now, what happens to a material, a conductor, as it cools? Now, you should remember that resistance is determined by a number of variables. It is determined by the material itself, which we call the resistivity. It's determined by the length of the particular material. It's determined by the temperature of the material and, of course, the cross-sectional area. And we're going to concentrate on the temperature. What happens, of course, as we understand, the expectation is, is that, that as a material cools, we're going to expect that the temperature causes the resistance to decrease. And it will decrease at a constant rate. But the expectation is, is that it will never actually reach zero resistance. Now, why is that? Well, two things determine the material's resistance. Number one is, the, of course, all these variables over here. But the thing is, is that the material is actually vibrating. The atoms are vibrating and they are causing the electrons to be slowed down. And we'll describe that in a moment. But there are also some impurities in the material. And those impurities will always be there regardless of the temperature. So the expectation is, is that those impurities will still contribute some resistance. So you're never going to get really complete superconductivity based on this um, because you'll never get rid of the impurities. But what Onus discovered is that, yes, in terms of mercury, the temperature does actually cause a decrease in resistance. But then suddenly, at a value not zero Kelvin, the actual resistance dropped to zero. And we call this the critical temperature over here. And that critical temperature is the temperature where the material ceases to be an ordinary conductor and becomes a superconductor. Now, that's really weird because, first of all, the actual resistance drops to zero at non-zero Kelvin. Secondly, it seems to ignore the whole issue of impurities in the first place. So let's have a look briefly at uh, what the lattice looks like. So here I have atoms arranged in a crystalline lattice. Now, of course, they are not stationary. They are actually moving. So in order for us to understand why a lattice causes electrons to slow down, I want you to imagine a room full of punching bags like so. And you would appreciate the fact that, that this would be fairly easy to run through because the punching bags are arranged geometrically. However, what would happen if all of these punching bags were to be moving quite randomly? Well, of course, you would run into them regularly. And that would cause two things to happen. You would slow down 
and your progress to the other side of the room would certainly be decreased. Secondly, you would cause a number of other punching bags to vibrate even more violently as you collide with them. So here I have my electron passing through the lattice. As you can see, two things happen. Number one, the electron gets slowed down as it collides with the vibrating lattice. That in essence will cause the electrons to slow down, so conductivity decreases. Secondly, the electrons will transfer some of that energy to the lattice, which will vibrate more violently and therefore causing it to heat up further. So that gives us the setup as to how the BCS theory came about. Before I go on and explaining the BCS theory, I want you to understand that the theory describes what we refer to as type 1 superconductors. And type 1 superconductors are materials that are metals or metalloids that already have some conductivity at room temperature. And so they display superconductivity at really low temperatures. Um, but like I said, we are only interested in metals and metalloids. And this periodic table here gives you the critical temperatures of, of a variety of different substances. And we're only interested at the moment here in the superconductors. And you can see beryllium has a critical temperature of 0 0.026 degrees Kelvin. So that is the temperature at which it causes it to go superconductive. Uh, technetium has 7.77, which is quite high, though we are talking about 7.77 degrees above absolute zero, so it's still around minus 266 degrees Celsius. Here is mercury, of course, and mercury is the one that Onus was investigating in 1911. But as you can see, all of these temperatures are quite low. Type 2 superconductors, and they are complex ceramics, have much higher critical temperatures, but the BCS theory does not explain them. So, the, the development of the BCS theory was done by three scientists named John Bardeen, Leon Cooper, and John Schrieffer. As you can see, that the theory came out by the first initial of their last name, the BCS theory. And so they developed this in 1957. Some of you may be aware of Bardeen. Bardeen was also instrumental in developing the first transistor in the early 50s. So here again, I have a representation again of my crystalline lattice. Now, as you, as I've explained, that they are vibrating much slower once they get below the critical temperature. But for the sake of this demonstration, I'm going to have them static. But please understand that they will be they will be vibrating slightly. To help us to appreciate it better, I'm going to introduce the bonds in between the atoms so that we can more easily see the effect of electrons on this crystalline lattice. And what would happen is if I were to place an electron in this particular area. Now this is of course occurs at below the critical temperature. And what happens is, is that the atoms surrounding this electron are attracted to this because of the fact that this is negatively charged and these are positively charged. So what we're getting here is a distortion of the lattice. Well, that means we get an increased positiveness here in this distortion. And this is called a phonon this particular distortion. And so what we have here is a phonon electron interaction. But the important thing is, is that the electron here will cause this distortion. If I move this electron, of course, over here, then the distortion would actually occur over there and these would return back to normal. So the presence of the electron as it moves the lattice causes the lattice to distort around it. But what does this distortion also do? Well, another electron is attracted to this distortion. And so what happens is that the second electron is attracted to this distortion as the distortion moves through the field due to this first electron. It's important that this electron here is not attracted to this electron. This electron here is attracted to the distortion that this first electron creates. So what happens next is that there is a weak bond, so to speak, developing between these two electrons, like so. And so what we now have here is these two electrons connected in some way. And this is referred to as a Cooper pair. Now, 
the details is, is the fact that the, this electron here is actually in some way, in terms of energy levels, connected to this electron here. And that's where the quantum mechanics comes in. But for all intents and purposes, from a high school perspective, understand that this electron is attracted to the distortion of the first electron, causing a weak link here. Now, I want you to understand, too, that the distance represented here between my first electron and my second electron is not quite accurate to scale. And in fact, in terms of the distances between the lattices here, the distance between these two electrons is, in fact, a thousand times larger. But nonetheless, there is a weak interaction between the two due to this effect here of this distortion of the lattice. So what happens, of course, is, is that as this electron moves through the lattice and the distortion occurs as the first electron passes through, it, so to speak, drags the other electron along. And that explains why this material becomes superconductive. Because now what we have is electrons passing through the lattice unhindered. Okay, These aren't vibrating greatly at all, causing this distortion to allow to take place. And therefore, these electrons pass through. You could argue that one sense this electron here is dragging the other electron along with it. Needless to say, this is a simplistic explanation of it. And if you were want, if you were studying at university, you probably do need to do a little bit more work on the quantum mechanics aspect of it, because quantum mechanics is really integral in understanding the actual whole BCS theory. So here is a quick animation to show you actually the net effect. So hopefully that gives you an understanding of the BCS theory. Again, thanks for watching. Bye for now. I hope you found that video useful. And remember, like, share and subscribe. Oh, and if you have a comment or a question, or you'd like a concept for me to explain to you, please drop a comment down below. I'm Paul from High School Physics Explained. Bye for now.